Um, before we start, so it took four PMs to come up with an icebreaker. All right. So by show of hands, I'm going to ask you to, to pick. All right. Between hip chat, who uses hip chat versus Slack? How many people use hip chat? Raise your hand. All right. Slack. All right. Okay. We know where this crowd ends. All right. Second one. Do you use Agile or Waterfall? Agile. All right. Waterfall. No one? Wow. Oh, one. Okay, good. Good. What, what's the product that you work on? So we work on, uh, on routers. Routers. Okay. That's a good, good system for routers, right? All right. Uh, third one. Um, for project tracking or for your for tracking your different projects, Jira or Google Docs? Jira, Google Docs. All right, a few more. Uh, just just, just two. Keeping it simple. All right, and last one, PayPal or Venmo? All right, PayPal. All right, Venmo. All right, that one's kind of even. All right. So uh, thanks for coming today. We are thrilled uh, that you're here with us. It's only <coughs> our second event in San Jose. Products that count is one of the largest product communities. We have about 20,000 members on our email list. How many people are not on the products that count email list? Raise your hand. All right, you should get on it. All right, the rest of you, this is how you probably heard about the event. And we have events in San Jose, San Francisco, New York, uh, soon to be in Seattle and also in Boston. So if you have uh, happen to be visiting there, tell your, or tell your friends. That's where we have events as well. Uh, we, these kind of events would not be possible without our sponsors. And we have a sponsor. Uh, I am uh, heading the product excellence and planning team here at eBay. Um, very excited to have you guys here. Uh, I've actually been a very big fan of products that count. So. Uh, I was very excited when I joined eBay six months ago to uh, bring this, you know, fun-filled crowd here at eBay. So, um, you know, enjoy your snacks and enjoy the rest of your evening. If you, uh, we're still, we're hiring crazy. Uh, if you guys have any, uh, you know, if you guys are looking for opportunities, then, you know, please check our, you know, website, eBay uh, Careers, uh, or reach out to me after the session and then we can talk, right? Thanks, Sanjaf. eBay has been an amazing uh, sponsor, and the space and the food. I think the food is the best of any of the products that count events. For those of you, who, yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, so if you've been to any of our other events, I think uh, it certainly beats the pizza and, pe and beer that I thought it was good. Um, we also have other sponsors. M Particle, can you guys stand up? Yeah. All right. Thanks for coming. And these guys all drove down from uh, San Francisco to be with us here today and have been sponsors of our other venues as well. So thank you. And Amplitude, where are you guys? All right, stand up. All right, thank you. Uh, great sponsors as well. Drove down from San Francisco and uh, it's great seeing you at both venues. Thank you. And if you guys have any questions on either of those uh, or all three of those companies, uh, please uh, go talk to them. And you've noticed that based on feedback from last time, we've implemented name tags. We didn't have name tags last month. Now we do. Uh, and to help with the networking, we also have the red dot, green dot. So red dot is for companies that are hiring. Green dots are for people who are looking or open to other opportunities. So hopefully that helped with some of the networking today. That's a big part of uh, why we come to these live events. So it's great to see people actually talking to each other and not sitting on chairs on their phones. So good job there, guys. And without further ado, we have our speaker, Mike Rushaver. Uh, and uh, Mike is currently Chief Product Officer at Beachbody. And he came up for this event just, from, uh, just for us, came up from LA this afternoon. Um, and uh, do we have anyone here? Who came here the furthest? So we have people from San Francisco. And little known fact that you, so all of that you can find on his LinkedIn profile. What you won't find on his LinkedIn profile oh. is there are some initials that are missing after his name. Oh, straight. Mm. Right? He's got me. Yeah. <laughs> MD. He's actually a physician. Not and practicing. Not practicing. <laughs> 
so don't take any medical advice from him this evening. But I think it's, it's cool that you're back in the health and fitness world. Right? Yeah, that yeah. So, um, great to have you here. Thanks so much for agreeing and coming up to be with us this evening. And we're all looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for the great introduction. And um, thank you all for coming. Thanks to the Products That Count team for putting this together. Um, the event and the amazing food. I, I sent a photo of that to my wife and she was like, I, I think I just saw a picture of heaven when she saw those shrimp bowls. Um, and it's, it's great to be here. It's great to see all, um, so many former Yahoos and, and meet new people as well. So um, my, my, my icebreaker questions are, are twofold. One, I'm, I'm curious, how many of you are at working at early stage startups? Good, a handful. How, how many at what we would say like a medium-sized company, you know, 20 to 100 or so people? And how, how many people at, at bigger companies? Great, great. And, and, and my other question is, and you'll, you'll see with the talk, always be shipping, how many of you seen the movie Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, the Coffee for Closers speech? Okay, so some of you, but not everyone, so I'll, I'll, I'll make sure and try to explain what this comes from. So always be shipping is, is a, a framework that I've developed that is modeled after that um, always be closing talk from Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. And it's really a, a set of a few simple rules that you can apply to product development to hopefully craft compelling, impactful, and profitable products, regardless of the stage of company you're working at, the industry you're in, the market landscape, the technology you have at hand, or the, the size of your team. And I'm gonna talk about this framework and I'm gonna walk you through three examples from some of the great companies and amazing teams that, that I've worked with to illustrate it. You might be thinking, well, the ABCs of sales always be closing. And here on the screen left, attention, interest, decision, and action, which are, that's kind of your typical sales funnel. Can you get someone's attention? Are they aware of your product? Then are they interested in it? Can you get them to go from interest to actually making the decision to use your product or buy it and pay you money. And to do that, they actually have to take an action. How, how do we adapt that to product development? I mean, it, it, it seems that you might be confused there because product and sales, in my experience at, at many different companies, are often seen as kind of warring factions. They're not necessarily aligned. If you're on the product side, you generally think that you want to deliver customer delight and build long-term value. And when I was looking for imagery to, to share with you in terms of customer delight, what I typically found were customers who looked like they were victorious. And so if you do image search for, for customer delight, you see people who are victorious, jumping for joy, and, and strangely and interestingly, it's, it's almost always at, at sunset. And in fact, I looked for um, cats that were delighted, and even the delighted cats are <laughs> delighted at sunset. Um, I don't know exactly why, but that's just how it is. Salespeople, on the other hand, seem to want something pretty different. They want someone to sign on that dotted line. They want a contract that's signed. They want to close the deal, because if you've seen this movie, coffee, is for closers only. If you don't close the deal, you don't get any coffee. How, how could these be similar, you would, you would ask. And the reason why they're similar is because those stories I just told you are stereotypes. The product person who only wants delight and the customer who only wants a closed deal. The stereotype is a widely held but oversimplified belief. And it's often true, but it's based on averages. And if you've taken the energy to come here tonight, that tells me that you don't want to be average. You want to be awesome. 
and you should be awesome. And the most successful product people and sales people can actually meet in the middle. Because if you're a product person, yeah, you absolutely want a delighted customer, but you also want to build revenue for your company. And if you're a, a salesperson, absolutely, you want to close deals, but you want a happy customer, and you want that customer to give you repeat visits and repeated revenue stream. And customers will pay you with money, but they'll also pay you with attention, or their time, or their content, or their data, all of which, in the internet world, we can turn into revenue, typically by advertising. So, so product and sales really aren't that far apart. And that's where this framework comes into play. So let's talk through attention, interest, decision, and action as it applies to product. So when I think about getting a customer or a potential customer's attention as a product person, especially in the world of software and the internet, we don't actually want to sell just one instance of a product. You know, that's kind of that, that experiment that the Wu-Tang Clan did where they sold one gold album to actually to Martin Shkreli. I think he's in jail. And we don't want that. We want to sell millions of copies of software. We want millions or tens of millions or billions of users. So when you're, as a product person, thinking about attention, you want to think about how can I get attention at scale? How can I get millions of customers? And if I've already got millions, how can I grow? And again, do you want to grow 10% a year or 15% or 20%? You want to grow, think big, 10,000%. 10, 10, you want to grow 10x. So you should always be thinking, how can I grow really big? How can I push myself and my team to grow at scale? In terms of interest, you want to interest someone in using your product. And to interest a potential customer, you have to know your customer. And what I typically tell people is that the more specific you are in defining your potential customer, the better. And I think this actually goes beyond uh, just demographics, you know, who you're targeting, or, or psychographics, the kind of behavioral attributes. And, and try to really think about the psychology of your customer. What motivates them? And, and what is going to trigger that customer delight, jumping for joy, Again, at, at sunset, apparently. Third, how do you get them to make a decision to pay you some money or give you some content or data in return for using your product? To do that, to get from interest to decision, you also have to understand deeply the context in which your customer lives. So understand the marketplace. What competitors are out there? What features are you competing with? How are your competitors pricing their product? What's the technology landscape? Where are things going? And, and, and finally, what resources are you and your team working with? Because you have to be realistic in what you can deliver to, to take the fourth step, which is creating an action plan. And so you take all of these factors, how you're going to get to scale, the deep understanding of your customer, the context in which they're operating and you're operating, and then, of course, you craft an action plan, which is really a series of steps to get to your end goal. And in product management world, we usually call that a roadmap. And it's really important to have those concrete steps because you've got to ship something. And we were talking here about Agile versus Waterfall. The beauty of Agile is it's a methodology to get you to ship product so that you can actually get feedback from your potential customers and learn whether what you're doing is successful or not. Get some data and move on. If you don't ship, you actually don't have a product. You have an idea or a plan or a series of really good conversations. But that's not going to pay the bills. So let's look at how we can apply this methodology to some examples um, from some of the companies I work with. And, due to the Yahoo alumni in the house, and that this was my, one of my first product management jobs, we'll go back to Yahoo, and, and we'll look at how we actually ended up bringing independent third-party content from experts onto Yahoo. And this is Yahoo back in 2003. There's the Yahoo homepage. Um, a couple of points of context for you here. 
at this point in time, there wasn't a lot of third-party expert content. The content on Yahoo was licensed from big providers, right? News was the AP. Um, we also had this strong editorial team. Everything that went onto the Yahoo homepage on most of our properties was vetted by the editorial team to make sure that it had integrity and it, it was authentic and added value. And that's kind of funny when you think about it, humans vetting content, and we know that really in the, over the long term, Google kind of won that race with their algorithms. But I think when we look back now, um, one thing that I think about pretty fondly is the fact that you could rest assured back in these days that on the Yahoo front page, you would not have seen what we call now fake news because everything was vetted and there was a lot of value here. So I want to tell you a little bit more about the Yahoo Health project. And there you see on the front page, way down in the left corner, those links to Yahoo Health. And that, it was a, an information site, kind of a, a portal with licensed content. Um, we were a small team in the media group, which had other properties like Yahoo News and sports and finance. It was really just a handful of people, a, a few engineers, designers, product people like myself spent most of our time building this portal, and the business model was very straightforward. We, we, monet, we got traffic, we monetized it with ads. But we wanted to grow. We wanted to get this attention at scale. That was our challenge. How can you expand past these people who are, might click on this link, or maybe we're doing a search and landed on Yahoo Health? When in fact, when we started to really understand our customers, most people who came to Yahoo actually had no idea that Yahoo Health even existed. They, they ended up there, and even sometimes when they came to Yahoo Health repeatedly, and you would ask them later, what do you think of Yahoo Health? They didn't know. They just thought they were on Yahoo or the internet. Another thing we'll talk about, though, so we're, we're thinking, how can we grow? How can we expand our audience? What tools do we have? Well. We have the Yahoo homepage. This was the number one page on the internet with hundreds of millions of visitors a day at the time. So gee, if we could go from here, that tiny little link, and take over that sort of real estate, that could really expand our audience. But we had to come up with something that would appeal to people who weren't specifically looking for health information. And we went out and we talked to our our users, our potential customers, and we found out, yeah, they were looking for that sort of health information. They were also really clued in to these health awareness days. And further, as we, as we all know now, people are, are genuinely interested in what celebrities have to say. So we came up with this plan to leverage celebrities around health awareness days to really expand the reach of Yahoo Health. And the constraints we're operating in the environment, as I said, is that we actually had a really small team. And everyone on the team, the vast majority of their day was spent building our health portal and trying to make that better and more usable and intake more information from our, from our third party providers. Secondly, if we were gonna pull off a, an event for an awareness day, we had a pretty tight timeline because breast cancer awareness day is October 1st. If you're not ready for an, an event on October 1st, when this was supposed to go up, you're going to miss it. So we had to hit a date. So we came up with something really quite simple, which is a quote card. And we went out and we got quotes from celebrities for breast cancer awareness. And we built, I'm going to show you, I, I promised one of my friends online that I would use the word uh, janky in this talk. And so we, we, we went out and it was a very manual build. We built a bunch of pages based on celebrity quotes. That's my favorite celebrity there. Got a quote from Hillary Clinton, and if you clicked on that link, you landed on this pretty janky page. But people loved it. They went, you, you see Hillary's quote, there are links to good information, and there's a little e-card where you could send these messages to your friends. And the e-cards were actually built by another team. They already existed. All we had to do is put an image there. So it was something that was pretty simple to build, and took actually uh, minimal engineering effort and design effort. It, we leveraged the fact that we had a strong PR team and marketing team. We could get these celebrities to give us content and manually build a bunch of HTML pages and get major ad sponsors 
and come up with something that was actually a repeatable model. There are a lot of awareness days, and this was something that worked. And then we evolved it. And so here you see a picture of, of Yahoo Finance back in the day with a bunch of experts um, contributing content as columnists. And, and we went from quote cards to actually building a blogging tool, a real technical tool, which relieved the team of doing all this manual work to bring content on. And it has lots of features, RSS feeds, comments, a whole system for managing um, the quality of the content that the Yahoo editors could use. So that's one example of how using that framework got us from, got us one, the attention of you know, millions of people who wouldn't have been exposed to Yahoo Health managed to get something out the door that was actually making money and then stepwise evolved it into actually a feature-rich platform that we used across the media group and then actually internationally across Yahoo properties. Um, my next example is LinkedIn. And so we'll fast forward a few years. And here we were developing what, what we will call a social advertising ecosystem. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. Here, this is actually a recent screenshot of LinkedIn. I couldn't get old screenshots of LinkedIn because it's a login only site. That's much harder to get from the internet archive. But it still illustrates the point. This, is a, this was back in 2010. And the mission of LinkedIn is to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. LinkedIn is a really mission-driven company, and so everything we did, we filtered through that lens of the LinkedIn mission. And our goal was to build the advertising business. So posing that challenge, how do you build an advertising business that makes professionals more productive and successful? And most ads, people don't, they don't click on them. They may even ignore them. There's one up there, uh, uh, you know. Wh what's your likelihood to click the IBM Cloud ad? Small. So, so looking at this framework, our, our first task is thinking about how can we scale a, an advertising product on LinkedIn? What are the assets we have? And what we realized is we have millions of companies on LinkedIn that had company pages. And if with all these companies, and hundreds of millions of LinkedIn members, we actually had billions of potential followers for companies. And back in 2010, though, um, before we launched this, the company page was rather static. Companies actually couldn't create content and post it into the LinkedIn feed. It was very automated. You would go to LinkedIn and you would see updates coming and they would say things like, this new VP joined a company or this company has posted certain jobs, but the companies weren't actively managing their pages. And working with other people on the team and looking at the millions of companies and potential billions of followers, we built a revenue model which said, look, if, if the companies were actually paying us to acquire followers, you could have a huge business. We could get to scale and it would be a different kind of advertising product. But we had to understand our customers. Would, would LinkedIn members actually want that? And so we went out and we talked to LinkedIn members, and it turns out that LinkedIn members, of course, they're, they're interested in jobs. That's what people primarily come, come to LinkedIn for. But they were actually also interested in what products these companies are selling. And they're also really interested in um, data from the companies, kind of intel, what's happening in their industry and their niche. So when we developed these ads, you'll see how they, they appeal to that. But as I said earlier, we also wanted to understand the psychology of the LinkedIn members so that we could develop something compelling. Um, one of the great engineers on the team had worked at the Stanford um, Virtual Human Interaction Lab, and she pointed out this study that shows that, uh, I, I won't read that to you because it's so long, but basically what it says is that people like have an affinity for brands if the imagery they see in the brand reminds them of themselves. Um, they called that in this study the doppelganger effect. It's pretty interesting. Um, so you apply a little science. You say, well, we're, we're going to develop these ads for companies. We know this doppelganger effect makes people have a higher affinity for brands and advertisements they see. 
Um, another word for the doppelganger effect is the Narcissus effect. The Greeks knew this way before Stanford researchers. People just like to look at themselves. So when you see the, the first set of ads we, we, we built, and the ads that are still running on LinkedIn, if you look at that, you'll see your own picture in these ads. And you'll also see that we tailored them to the research we had done with our customers, where they don't just say, hey, follow the company to learn about their products. We were in the marketing business. They say, learn about jobs, get news, learn about products. So they were really tailored to both the psychology of the customers and what they knew they were interested in. And we also had to craft this action plan. So we, once again, uh, the team that we were working with was, was pretty small engineering-wise, so we literally built this one ad. These are just different, different formats of it. And there are kind of two ways to go about it. What we could have done was um, allow companies to post updates into the feed like they do on Twitter and Facebook and get followers and, and, and see what the activity was like. But our, but our main goal was to develop the advertising business. So instead, we developed a pilot program we went out to a bunch of our big potential customers who are currently buying the banner ads. We found the internal innovators at these companies, people who wanted to take a risk. And we said, hey, we're thinking of doing this new thing where you can actually post content onto LinkedIn from your company and acquire followers. We weren't even letting people, that, that feature actually hadn't launched, the ability to post content into the LinkedIn feed by a company. And we managed to sell, oh, I think it was about 30 companies into the pilot program who actually paid us money for ads that literally wouldn't work until we turned on the status updates. That's a really strong signal that you have a product that's gonna stick when people are paying for it before it'll launch. So we, so we went ad product first, launched that, saw that we had traction. Those early customers got the feature first and then we shifted and started building free features to engage more companies. Things like targeted updates, so you could post an update and target it to your audience. You know, redesign the company page so it was more engaging and more attractive to companies. And this was actually built after I left. You can see that they continue to evolve this where advertisers can really personalize their ads and you'll see that the clean look, it looks, looks a lot better. It's probably not all appealing to you because that's my face. If you were all looking at your face, you'd think that's, a, that's an amazing ad. And, and last, we then, after getting them followers, we let them expand their reach. So here's the company page now, and you see the update, and there's a product that was launched soon after I left that company for Pandora that allowed companies to sponsor a post and put it to people outside of the reach of their follower base, which became the fastest growing ad product for LinkedIn, and also worked really well in, in the mobile environment. Third, we'll, we'll talk about this framework um, as it applied to Pandora. And Pandora, as most of you know, is essentially a radio product. And, and, and that's what it was when I was there. It was a pure radio product. I grabbed this picture again, image search, and I kind of forgot that this isn't just a radio. I think that's a, that's a CD there, but who uses CDs anymore? So Pandora is a simple personalized radio product um, monetized by ads. There's a subscription feature, but back um, in 2003, 2013, sorry, 2014, the Pandora Premium, what that meant is you were essentially buying an ad-free version. So a small percentage of power listeners would buy the ad-free version. And Pandora also, important to know, is primarily a mobile product. The vast majority of usage is through the app on your iPhone, your, your Android, not on the desktop. So with that in mind, we apply this framework, um, what is the first thing we wanted to do? We want scale, we want to grow Pandora's business. Now, Pandora at the time had 80 million active listeners in a month. That's a lot of people. And in fact, we had about 250 million registered users. And if you think about that, and you're thinking about growing the audience, 250 million registered users for a product that is almost only used in the United States means that if you're an adult in the US, you probably have a Pandora registration. So it's pretty hard to grow the user base. What we really wanted to do is increase engagement and get people listening more frequently and for longer. Because the longer you listen and the more often you listen, we're selling more ads. 
and we're probably driving more people into the subscription product because they're getting sick of the ads. So we've got to understand our customer to figure out how can we get them to listen longer. Because we've already got this magic algorithm that plays music for you that you like. And for that, I want to share a couple of key data points. That again, I, I, I thought were pretty interesting as, as the team dug into it at the time. Um, one is that when you listen to music, as we all know, how many of you feel good when you listen to music that you like? Well, just about half of you. <laughs> well, that's because it, when you listen to music you like, you, your brain releases dopamine, which is the, the pleasure drug in response to stimuli such as food and money. But it turns out also in response to music you like. Your brain releases dopamine, you feel freaking good. Dopamine comes right from your neuron. You feel great. And in fact, you, you get the biggest dopamine rush from listening to music you like that you didn't expect to hear. So you're listening to the radio or you're listening to Pandora and a song comes on that you've never heard before and you like it, you feel great. That's the best response. You're pleasantly surprised. Kind of reminds you of those people jumping for joy. So the team was thinking about how can we get, how can we deliver more of that? How can we deliver more moments of joy to people who already listen to Pandora? And once again, idea, great, great ideas come from anywhere. One of the engineers on the team came up to me, I can still remember it, and he handed me a study, and he said, hey, you know, all these people are sleeping with their cell phones. This was back in 2015. 76% of Americans sleep next to their cell phones. And in fact, of the younger people, they actually sleep with their cell phones. <laughs> Crazy, right? So we know that your brain likes music. We know that you sleep with your phone. You don't have to do a scientific study to know that everyone sleeps every day and wakes up every day. And we know that alarm buzzers, whether it's alarm from your phone or your little clock, it sucks. That's not a great way to wake up. So the, well, wait a second. This, this thing doesn't always wake you up with a buzzer. The, the AM FM radio plays music. And Pandora is a radio product. So the idea was, why don't we build an alarm clock for Pandora that actually plays you music when you wake up? Wouldn't that be cool? We can beat FM radio. We're totally aligned with the core Pandora product experience because it's a radio product. And then when you wake up, instead of hearing FM radio, you hear this personalized stream of music that you like. And in fact, maybe we can actually tweak the algorithm so that you don't wake up to an ad. Because you know, when you wake up to that FM radio and it's an ad, and those morning shows are almost all ads, that's pretty annoying. So that was the challenge. But the big question is, um, Would people use this? Because it, that, using Pandora as an alarm clock is not the number one use case for Pandora. People use it at work. People use it when they drive. How could, could we get people to use it as an alarm clock? And then, and then secondly, if, if we could, there were some other um, challenges that I'll, that I'll talk about in a second. Um, one, as I mentioned, the ads. And the other is that our, our main usage was iOS. And actually, at the time, iOS had certain restrictions. If the app wasn't in the foreground, um, you, can't, you can't actually activate an app. So if someone, if we had built this alarm clock and you set your alarm clock on Pandora and then go and do something else, which everyone does, then you're on Facebook or Twitter or doing anything else with your phone, we could not actually trigger the alarm and it wouldn't wake you up. But that would be a very bad experience. So we had to solve that problem. But even before we went to solve these technical problems, we had to figure out would people use it. Um, one of the product managers on the team had actually done um, UX research. He had, he had a master's in research, and he had just moved into product management. So we did some um, design sketches, literally on paper. And he had the skill set of user research, so he wrote some questions to validate it and went to Pandora's in Oakland. He went around to coffee shops in downtown Oakland and asked a bunch of people about this idea. You know, Do you listen to Pandora? And if they said yes, then we actually showed them some wireframes. And we got a really good response. Like the vast majority of people were really thrilled with the idea. So we're like, okay, this has legs. And we're able to do that quickly and cheaply 
with, with pen, paper, and walking around downtown Oakland in a matter of, if I remember right, just a couple of weeks to validate it. And then the team worked on those, those, um, those issues. Managed the playlist so that ads wouldn't play as the first, first thing you hear, and came up with what I thought was a really clever design pattern where when you activate the alarm on iOS, it just locks it into the foreground. And if you closed it out, it'll tell you, hey, you're turning off the alarm. You want to do that or not? And if you close it anyway, you know, um, hit your home screen, we'll send you a mobile push that says, hey, by the way, you just turned off your alarm. So it was a super clever solution that designers came up with. Technically, the playlist team figured out how to modify it so we could play ads in the right time. Tech, um, and then we launched it. With, within, this all went from, from engineer handing that data to me to launch within a couple of months, and people loved it. So here's someone on Twitter saying, hey, they just launched it. Um, yesterday I was wishing Pandora had an alarm clock and wondering if it ever would, and today it does. This is freaking awesome. Well, unless maybe you were listening to Chief Keefe Station, but besides that, everyone really liked it. So that, that feature ended up driving significant engagement for Pandora because we had hundreds of thousands of people who are now waking up to Pandora, so they're using it more frequently. And because you're waking up to it first, it's playing several songs. It's increasing your listening time as well. Um, so, so there's the framework for you. It's, it's very straightforward. It comes modified from Glenn Gurry, Glenn Rost of getting attention at scale, interesting your customers by knowing your customers, getting them to make a decision by really understanding the context in which they operate and you operate, and formulating an action plan where you can get something out and actually get feedback from them. And I wanted just to leave you with, with two other points, which is that in all these cases, you'll see that the teams both embrace their strengths and leverage their strengths. At Yahoo, it's the homepage, who leveraged that big source of traffic. At LinkedIn, it was the personalization, the data we had, the fact that we have your profile image we could use, and we had millions of companies on the platform. And at Pandora, it was the fact that we had that algorithm that will play music you like. Leverage your strengths and embrace your weaknesses, whether it's a small team and, and not a lot of resources, or the fact that you might be handicapped by iOS and figure out a way to work around it. And if you do that, you can craft that action plan that'll get you shipping. Because at the end of the day, you want to ship products that leave your customers jumping for joy, even if they're cats, and be awesome. That's it. Yeah, good question. The question was, why'd you, why'd you go to Beachbody from uh, these different tech com companies? Um, I was actually a Beachbody user before I joined the company. And I told a couple people this story. When my wife and I moved to New York, we decided like we would try to get in shape because we knew moving across the country is stressful. So, excuse me, so, so she actually bought a package from a personal trainer for us and we used a personal trainer. We had 10 weeks with a personal trainer and we got in shape and personal trainers are pretty expensive. Those are like 100 bucks an hour. But it was great, it was a great kickstart for us. Um, there are actually a couple of former Yahoo's who were working at Beachbody who told me about their product and I was in New York, I started using Beachbody and I was like, this, this fitness program is amazing. I got in great shape, and I thought that the workouts were actually much better than I'd gotten from my personal trainer. And at the time, I think I was paying 15 bucks a month versus 100 bucks an hour. So I knew there was a lot of value in the program. And as I was using it in the gym in the building that I lived in in New York, I would look around, and there were always one or two other people in the gym doing beach body workouts with their, usually with their iPads. And, and in fact, I became friends with one of the guys in my building because he noticed me doing my thing. And he was like, hey, I can tell you're doing uh, this Beachbody thing because I recognize the moves. So I thought, one, there's a lot of value. 
Two, um, people are using it. And, and third was that some folks I knew were there. So when they reached out to me to help build the on-demand service, I thought it was something that had a lot of potential. That's a great question. The question, repeating the question was, how do you separate your own biases? You use the product and you're, you're working to design the product and develop it. How do you separate your own biases? I think the, the best way to do that is to actually talk to your customers. You, know, you, can't, you have to get out of your own ivory tower where you come up with ideas that you think are great and talk to the people who are really using your product. Um, Beachbody is a great example because a lot of the folks who work at Beachbody are into fitness. And a lot of the folks on the product team who are building the product, whether they're product managers or engineers, are guys. And they're really into fit they're guys who are really into fitness. So the guys who are really into fitness think about features for fitness enthusiasts. But if you go out and talk to the average Beachbody customer, super enthusiastic fitness guys, like I was when I first started using Beachbody, that is actually not our average customer. Our average customer, the majority of our customers are women who are using Beachbody to, not just to get fit and get ripped, to lose weight and feel better and be healthy. And by talking to those people and also talking to our Beachbody coaches, you understand that and then you can shift your mindset from building a bunch of features that you really want as a power user to making sure you build features for your audience. So just a little, another example of that is when I got to Beachbody, the roadmap was oriented to, more toward power users. And we shifted it a bit to the average user and really shoring up um, key aspects of the service in terms of quality and reliability and looking at pricing to adjust it. And, with that, we saw really strong growth in subscriptions. So you mentioned like one of the key things that the success is promoting your customers. And in a lot of examples, you mentioned actually talking to them about, about insights. Uh, especially now that A-B testing is uh, a big part of the engine to scale and lots of new products, how is A-B testing going to fit? And how are, why it's so important to continue to talk to customers? And in what instance do you use A-B testing versus actually going out and reaching out? Great, good. another really good question. So how do you, the question essentially is how do you balance talking to your customers versus A-B testing? And I, I, really, I do think you should use both. I didn't talk about A-B testing, but we, we use that at all the companies I worked at. Um, at Pandora, there's A-B testing both in the playlist and the user interface. At Beachbody, we do A-B testing. Um, but you, you can't, it's very hard to A-B test your way into a brand new experience. And A-B tests can be somewhat expensive, especially when you're building a new thing. If you have an existing page or funnel, let's say an acquisition funnel, you can use A-B testing to you know, vary the buttons and vary the text and do a whole bunch of interesting things where intuitively you're not going to get the right answer until you A-B test it. But to validate a new idea, I think the best way is you go out and talk to people and you can do something lightweight, like I was talking about in the Pandora case where it's literally sketches on paper, questions, person, questions in person, get a lot of information. And generally what I've seen is if you have a, a strong majority of people who respond positively or negatively, that's a great signal and you'll save yourself a lot of time. And, and the Pandora example, we've done that at, at Beach Body as well, where we've designed some new interfaces. We get out and we talk to customers. We get out and we talk to our trainers, and they give us great feedback fast. And you can get that in about a literally a number of days sometimes, and then move forward. And then, then you build it, and then A-B test the interface to perfect it. So following on that, Thank you. 
Hmm. Um, the, the, the question was, do you, do you, what do you do first? Do you talk to a bunch of people and then figure out your user segments or user segments first? Um, for me, I've, I've generally focused on defining the user segments first and then talking to people who map to those segments. Um, partly, I think that's because of the stage of the company where I've been working where we, where we have an audience already. So when we did some of the research um, for Beachbody, we understood our demographics pretty well, and we looked at um, different types of users, and we actually created um, personas for a few different types of people, beginners, you know, intermediates, advanced people, etc. and then went out and talked to those various segments of people pretty specifically. question is how do, how do you incorporate research? Um, good question. Generally, it's just something you, I, I, uh, that is a good one. How do I do it? I, my, my, the tip of my tongue was I just use Google. You know, I, tr I try to think, of, as I'm saying, like once you've defined that customer segment, um, and I talked about demographics and psychographics, right? Demographics are generally those uh, customer attributes. Um, you're a, 24 to 30 year old male that lives in a city. Psychographics are behavioral attributes. That is a person who, you know, what uh, is, is a fitness enthusiast or is um, a vegetarian or something like that. And, but then if you want to go deeper, I, I find that you go in and actually kind of look for some psychological, uh, sorry, psychological, um, scientific research around those people. And it's so available now on the internet that you can you can rather quickly find studies around people's behavior, the psychology, or, or, or even the neurochemistry that motivates them. And, and that can be really powerful because it'll clue you into um, some specifics around what people are looking for or what will get the right reaction from them. So I would say, I guess another way to answer it is I would say, do it all the time and really dig into the research. We did it, again, at all of the companies I've worked at. Um, we, we've done that. I showed you the example from, from the Stanford Labs. Um, we did it at Pandora. We, we do it in Beachbody in terms of um, motivating people for fitness. There's a lot of research out there that, that you can leverage. And, I, and I, I would imagine, you know, like, kind of no matter the context, you can dig in and find that. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks once again, Mike. My pleasure. Thanks so much. So we, for those of you who've been to our sessions before, we now enter our shout-outs section. Shout -out. uh, shout outs are basically anyone's invited to come up and take the mic. And um, if you're hiring, if you're looking for opportunities, um, 